Um, thanks very much, um, Jenny. Um, and hello, everyone. Thanks for attending this. And many, many thanks to the organizers for um, organizing this extremely well-designed event. I'm delighted to hear this diversity of voices, particularly from China. And I've just put in the chat box um, the uh, title of the Chinese translation to geopolitical economy for the critically important audience from China. I'd like to add that I'm also co-editor of the New Cold War website, www.newcoldwar.org. And we have been tracking developments along these lines since 2014. And uh, we'd love to see further material on it. Um, what I want to address is um, the sort of broader issue. I think a lot of um, uh, 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 panelists have pointed to a number of uh, so given us a rich panoply of the details of the situation. I want to now step back and say, you know, if we, if we want to protest and plead the case of new Cold War, how do we ensure that the new Cold War against China does not come to pass or, or is, is stopped if, if we believe it's already underway, which is kind of true. Um, the key lies, I think, in the evolution of what I call the geopolitical economy of capitalism up to its present moment. Um, this geopolitical economy promises, the present moment promises to be a further reversal of fortunes for imperialism, a reversal that can be said to, that can be traced back to the late 19th century in the competition of imperial powers, which culminated in the First World War, the weakening of imperialism and decolonization after the Second World War, and it continues to this day in the rise of multipolarity. Cold Wars, previous and present, have been ways in which the West has tried to stem um, this, uh, this reversal of imperialism. And the present one is significant because it takes place at a time when capitalism is at a lower ebb than ever before. I think this gives it the distinctive character. Uh, in this regard, I want to make three points. The first one is that the relations between countries do not flow ethereally about societies. They are built on the dynamics of societies, particularly on the unstable dynamics arising from the contradictions of capitalism. They have driven the, birth, uh, driven the international relations of capitalism from its birth until today. So today we see the drive towards the new Cold War which is also resulting in opposed alliances on the one hand between the capitalist powers led by their most neoliberal powers, such as the United States, the United Kingdom, the various Anglo countries in particular. Um, uh, and and uh, so it arrives, uh, they're trying to create a, a, an alignment between these powers on the one hand and the rivals and defiant victims of these powers. So China, Venezuela, Iran, Russia, etc. All of these are a combination of rivals and defiant victims of these powers. The essence of the dynamics of uh, uh, neoliberal capitalism li today lies in the crumbling of neoliberal orders that the pandemic has accelerated but not caused. It has led to a disarray of capitalist forces. It has endangered their hold on developments, both domestic and international. The new aggression against China stems directly from this. It constitutes a SOP or a substitute for addressing the real problems of the economy, which popular forces are demanding. They cannot really address the econ uh, real problems of the economy because that would definitely involve advancing away from capitalism towards some sort of socialism, which these capitalist classes do not want to do. That is what makes this moment very dangerous. They are they will do everything in their power to hang on to this uh, situation. Only two things can uh, stop this, and they probably have to work in combination. One is the deft management of this danger by China, and I'll tell you why I think it can do that, and by China's allies, and by progressive politics in the US and other imperialist countries. So popular forces in neo uh, neoliberal countries can play a critical role. In order to understand why and how their role can be played, I come to my second point. Imperialism has historically benefited the, uh, uh, the, the, the working classes of the imperial core, but its reversal has the promise of benefiting them even more. So Lenin was not wrong to when he talked about the labor aristocracy in imperialist countries. However, the benefits they derive from being a labor aristocrats in imperialist societies are nothing compared to what they stand to gain from the reversal of imperialism. Let me just give you two examples. Take Roosevelt. 
he is known for the new deal as a sort of you know a, a period of you know a, a, a alleviation of the condition of working classes but he also launched the good neighbor policy it involved a softening of the us stance towards latin america and it was part of a larger reorientation of american foreign policy which included the establishment of relations with the soviet union against which up to that point the us had been co uh, conducting an unremitting war to try to overturn the fledgling revolution so these were the international equivalents of the green new deal they went together and became policy only when the great depression brought us capitalism to its knees the us was the worst sufferer of the great depression and even then it only happened after an administration able to acknowledge this reality and the need to address it was elected that's an important point to remember that's why politics makes a difference and uh, so and the second example is simply the golden age of welfareist keynesian welfare states they went hand in hand with decolonization for a reason it is because of the reversal of imperialism which narrowed the options of ruling classes at home that domestic investment and domestic consumption became more important than it could be for countries with ample colonies so i think that in this way the, the anti-imperialism and working class movements have a stronger bond than the labor aristocracy thesis, which is not untrue, underlines. And that's, that involves a whole bunch of things there. My final point is that two developments are coming together to make an international order which has no prospect any longer of being driven by the unstable dynamics of world capitalism. And therefore, it is possible to transit to a new international order which can be under the control of saner powers which are committed to consciously organizing their societies in popular interest. But to get there, we have to stop the new Cold War being sponsored by the neoliberal capitalist interest and in the core neoliberal countries. And we must undermine their power. So I think going into the future, I think we, we may also see, as we are already beginning to see, a division between the very strictly neoliberal, largely Anglo-American uh, Anglo, uh, 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 countries and on the other hand, say, continental Europe, which may well choose to, to, to go another way. Okay, so a couple of sub points here. The disarray of neoliberalism means that more and more, more and more capitalism is not going to be able to deliver. It's going to be a no show at major problems. So more and more societies will have to think about organizing their productive activities consciously. And I, by this, I mean, including the neoliberal societies, particularly the neoliberal societies. The more democratically they do it, the more they will lay claim to be socialist or to be on a socialist path, however, this cannot happen unless the left in these countries once again begins to think about planning and organizing economies, something they have neglected to do for decades. Uh, this neglect, which, is, which includes fantasizing about, you know, uh, 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 decentralized small uh, unit uh, uh, capitalism without planning or whatever. Um, so th this neglect has permitted them to be uncritically critical of actual attempts to build socialism, whether in the USSR and the Eastern Bloc or today in China, Cuba or, or, or uh, Vietnam, etc. Actual responsibility for building an alternative to capitalism will compel them to learn from these attempts. They are not perfect, but responsible critique of their limitations will, will be necessary and can only help the people of those countries as well. That is to say the countries already on a socialist path. But engagement must replace dismissal, the dismissal that has reigned so far. So finally, the rise of this society, the, uh, 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 the communist party state that is poised to be the leading power, although I agree with the point that is made that it does not seek to replace the, the alleged hegemony of the United States. This opens the door to saner international relations of mutual benefit between sovereign countries, a sort of pluripolar world, as Hugo Chavez would have said, uh, who will sovereign countries who will promote the popular interests each in their own way. And China's ability to lead rests on the beneficial economic pull it exerts on its neighbors. Um, as the late and, and, and much missed Jude Woodward pointed out in her book, The US versus China, Asia's New Cold War. China can counteract 
the largely symbolic reward the US and the West can offer because it has something much more substantial to offer. Its economic magnetism is going to play an important role and is already permitting China to respond in a saner way because it is less threatened, it is more confident. Capitalism is much weaker today than before and China has built her strengths. China has built a house of bricks, not a house of straw or, or, or whatever that can easily be blown down. Thank you very much.